right, well, let's dive in to chapter 14 this morning. Jesus, um, in the episode this morning that we find in his life, he's he's at the room, he's at uh, the home of a ruler of the Pharisees. Pharisees, religious leaders uh, of the day, had things a little back, backwards, and he's there. Jesus is invited to the home of the ruler of the Pharisees, and it's particularly on the Sabbath, um, and he's there to eat. Now, these Pharisees were his enemies. They were constantly working against Jesus, always had their eye on him, always trying to trap him so they could find something against him. But Jesus was there. He went into this home unintimidated, even though he stuck out like a sore thumb. You ever been somewhere and stuck out like a sore thumb? Jesus likely did there in the midst of these guys. He was there at this house, not to be like them, but to speak the truth to them, to help them. He was there not to seek their approval or to rub elbows with them to gain social advancement. No, he was there to confront their sin. He came as a guest to this dinner, but he soon became the host of a conversation about spiritual truth. Jesus was always about his father's business. And this dinner opportunity actually was, for him, a mission opportunity. So I want you to note two things before we deal with these two confrontations Jesus had at this, at this event. First thing I want you to see. Mission should be our goal in any situation that we're in. No matter where we are, what we're doing... The Father's business should always be our goal. It's, our, our goal in, in, in certain situations ultimately is not to gain social status points. So dinner parties, social gatherings, any life event are not vacations from ministry. Any, any place we're in, anything we're doing, we're not seeking to make our name great. We're seeking to make his name great. Amen? So we should, yes, like Jesus did, we should go among unbelievers. We are to be among them, but we're not going to them to be like them. We go boldly as opportunity arises and as opportunity we make it. Go boldly sharing God's truth, not changing His truth, not ignoring His truth, just to be admired or avoid the consequences of sharing we don't want any one of our conversations or, 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 or interactions in this world, we don't want any opportunity or any conversation, any words wasted with eternally meaningless actions or words. Don't wait, let's not waste our words. Let's use them for the purpose of the kingdom. So that's the first thing I want you to see as we jump in. Second thing is this. Jesus went into this into this Pharisee's house, and he confronted them. He stuck out like a sore thumb, but he confronted them in their sin. Jesus intends to confront us with his truth, with no apology. Jesus doesn't affirm our love of self and our love of sin. There's a phrase that's kind of swimming around culture today, call, and it says, you do you. You do you. Jesus doesn't come saying you do you. Jesus comes saying you do what I call you to. I understand sometimes the, the heart behind that phrase you do you might not be as malicious as it sounds. But if we are not careful, you do you can be a very inwardly focused about you piece of advice. You do you. You just do what makes you feel good. You do what you think you should do. You do what makes you feel self-affirmed. You do you. But Jesus is like, no, get your eyes off of yourself and you do what I call you to do. Jesus doesn't affirm who we are. We're sinful, 
remember. But he confronts who we are. That's the whole purpose of, not the whole purpose, but a purpose of 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, next word, rebuking, next word, correcting, next word, training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped with every good, for every good work. Jesus confronts us. The word of God is not to just kind of move us along in the direction we're already going. God's word, Jesus through his word, wants to stop us. Like, like you're going down a road, right? And there's a guy up there with that little, you know what I'm talking about, that little, that little sign that on one side says slow and the other side says stop. You know what I'm talking about when they're working on one lane of the road and you know, they got to kind of direct traffic? You know, it's like that guy or a flag man that's, that's just like, hey, you, you gotta, there's a detour. The road's out here. you got to go this way. Jesus is that guy saying stop the way you're going. Stop doing you. Go do me. Go this way. So when he speaks to us, if we are his, we will follow his way. John 10, 27. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So, as we deal with this passage today, may we be counted as his sheep who follow him. And so, I wanted, I wanted, there's three, maybe four main confrontations in this passage. I was going to deal with three of them today, but we're only going to deal with two. And we'll deal with the third one, and on, on into the passage uh, next week. But I want to deal with two confrontations Jesus had at this, at this uh, event, at this Pharisee's house. Confrontation number one. Those in the house uh, that Jesus was in, they were watching Jesus. They were scrutinizing him. This, this, this word possibly carried the connotation with it. They were spying on him with malicious intent. They were, they were just kind of watching to see what he's going to do. Jesus was constantly under scrutiny. Believer. Be prepared to be scrutinized. Be prepared to be watched by the world. And let your witness be pure and Christ-like that people may see Jesus and know his character, know his goodness, and know his gospel. Unbelievers are always watching us. If we always live as if God is watching us, then we can, that can help guard us against living inconsistent, hypocritical lives. That if we do live inconsistently and hypocritically, we're giving people a reason to, to malign God's name because of our hypocrisy. So just real quick, everybody was watching Jesus. People are watching you. People are watching me. What do they see? Do they see one that represents Jesus or one that represents you? So there at this, at this event, there was, a, there was a man with dropsy. I, I don't know dropsy. But uh, apparently I'm, I'm told it's, it's like edema. Um, fluid buildup, swelling in certain parts of the body. Some think this guy was a plant by these Pharisees to bait and trap Jesus, to see if Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath. And as such, they could have a case against him, breaking their man-made Sabbath laws. And scripture doesn't indicate why this guy was there, but all eyes were on Jesus. And with this sick man before him, Jesus asks the Pharisees, he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? You see, God's law said not to work on the Sabbath, to cease from our work. But there was no law that God gave that prohibited healing on the Sabbath. But the Pharisees... In a weird attempt at, at, at holiness, the Pharisees had, had so many man-made laws that they added to God's law that God never intended. And many of these laws concerned what you could and could not do on the Sabbath day to kind of guard people against not working. One of their additional Sabbath laws allowed for the treating of a sick person on the Sabbath day only if it was a life or death situation. Otherwise, working, quote-unquote, to minister to the sick was to wait until the Sabbath was over. J.C. Ryle says the interpretation of God's law respecting the Sabbath was never intended to be strained so far as to interfere with charity, kindness, and the real needs of human nature, end quote. 
So just as we keep moving, our final authority, this reminds us, our final authority on spiritual matters is what the Bible says, not extra spiritual rules that people create and try to impose on other people, no matter what the intentions are, even for holiness. Our final authority is God's word, not man's rules. So when Jesus asked them if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath, they were in a pickle. If they said it was okay to heal on the Sabbath, they would go against their errant interpretation of Sabbath laws, admitting that God's law didn't prohibit it. But if they said it's not permitted, then in front of these folks, they're just seen as heartless. Here's this sick guy. Yeah, you got to wait till tomorrow. So they might have brought this guy in trying to corner Jesus, and they may, may have been trying to corner Jesus, but he has turned the tables on them, and he's, he, he's now put the focus on them. What do you say? Which, again, just a little diving board tangent right here. Don't try to outsmart Jesus. You're, you'll lose. And, and we laugh. You know, I anticipated maybe a laugh there. We laugh, but we do it. We do that. We try to outsmart Jesus, but we don't say, well, I'm trying to outsmart Jesus. Many people try to argue with Jesus about a situation in your life. Sometimes we like to argue with him about his word and what he calls us to do. Sometimes we try to outsmart his word or minimize his word or reinterpret his word to what makes feel, you know, feels good for us. Sometimes we try to outsmart Jesus to relieve ourselves of obedience to his word. But when we deal with his word honestly, his word pokes holes in our thinking instead of our thinking poking holes in his word. So Jesus asked the question, how do they respond? This is how they respond. They remained silent. They were silent. <laughs> they had no scriptural justification for their man-made thinking of Sabbath behavior. So they just didn't respond in the affirmative or the negative to Jesus' question. And don't we do that? We like to avoid the issue when God and His Word confronts certain issues in our lives. We just change the subject or try to quit thinking about it. So Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, as He says in Luke chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus healed him, proving that it was lawful in God's eyes to heal on the Sabbath. And, and then He confronts their hearts, reminding them that they would make provision for necessary work to rescue their son or ox out of a well on the Sabbath, those things which had familial and, and, and financial value to them. If, if, if their son fell in a well on the Sabbath, or their ox, which was financially valuable to them, of course they would make provision to work to get them out of there on the Sabbath. Those things affected them. But they had a lack of compassion for those who were suffering on the Sabbath. Those situations that didn't affect them personally. They were selfish, unloving hypocrites. A suffering person made in God's image is much more valuable than a trapped ox. F.B. Meyer says, If men care for their beasts, how much more will Christ care for men? And I'm going to read this quote, even though it might make us fidget a little bit. Warren Wearsby says this, It is tragic that some people even today have more love for their pets than they do for their family members, their neighbors, or even for a lost world. The Pharisee system of religion with all their extra laws had become more external than internal. It became more about strictly keeping not only God's law, but all the extra ones in order to appear holy before others and to earn God's approval and salvation. This distracted them from what God truly required. And this is what He truly requires. Admitting our sin, admitting our inability to keep God's law perfectly as He requires. Trusting in Christ alone to save us, to give us a righteousness that we don't have and that we can't attain. And let Him change us from the inside out. These Pharisees and all their laws, they just move from matters of the heart to just what people see. They cared more for appearing holy on the outside without being changed on the inside. And that's a problem. And they were the religious leaders of the day, some of them. 
And so they had influence over people. And they were leading them astray. We've got to be sure, folks, that we follow the true gospel and not a man-made gospel. Can you imagine a kid, right? He's, 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 uh, he's saving up money to go get something awesome. Some, some toy or some gadget or some whatever kids like to get today. And he's saving up his money, saving up his money, saving up his money. And time, it's time to go get his little gadget, his little toy. He goes into the store to purchase this, this toy. He goes up to the counter. And the clerk takes his money and he holds it up. And you know how they do it now. They shine that light or whatever they do. And he's like, son, all your money's counterfeit. It, it, it has no value. And all this time he's been banking on what is false to get what he wants at the end. And when we focus on a false gospel, a man-made gospel, even one that that seems to be respected maybe in those that we admire in the community or in in, in certain quote-unquote churches or what, what, when we we accept what what seems to be right or seems to be uh, uh, desirable, what just seems good and it's false, one day it's going to be seen as false. It's going to be seen as counterfeit. We've got to be sure that we're following the true gospel, not a man-made one. And two, we've got to, we've got to be careful that, that we ourselves don't impose on others laws that God did not give. Maybe they're your personal opinion, but if it's not scriptural, when we do that, burdening them, it burdens them, and it might turn them away from Christ. It, it may lead them astray. These, these Pharisees, their commitment to so many legalistic rules in an attempt at man-made holiness was more valuable to them than compassion for people. They were, they were so religious in their man-made laws that they just chased compassion out of their life. Aren't religious people, religious people sometimes the meanest sometimes? Their perspective was skewed big time. I was trying to think of some examples, and I'll just throw some out. I remember dealing uh, sometime many years ago with, Ken, don't let these youth wear hats in the church. Don't let them wear your hats in the church. Okay, I get it. It's a respect thing, whatever. They need to learn respect to all that kind of thing. But there's no law in Scripture that says you can't wear a hat in a building where the church meets, right? And you may have an opinion about respect for others and, and God and all that kind of thing, and you might not wear your hat, but somebody else might not, it might not be somebody else's thing. And so we don't have a lack of compassion for them or treat them terribly just because that difference is there. That's legalistic. You may have something against tattoos, but there's no scripture that says don't get a tattoo. We treat people with compassion, whether we agree with whether they have a tattoo or not. You may not agree that some people homeschool their kids, or you might not agree that some people send their kids to public school or private school. You get where we're going. We treat people with compassion. These are issues that we keep, keep, that keep us from loving people and showing compassion to people. Something, a barrier between them or, 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 or just press them down imposing our thoughts on them. Even issues like marrying between eth- ethnicities. Ethnicities. Is that the right word? Marrying between races. Some people can't stand that. But there's no scripture that says you can't do that. So no matter our intentions... If we care for our legalistic rules and our traditions that God didn't give more than we care for the people that God did give us to love, then we've got to repent. We've got to repent. So that's the first confrontation. The second confrontation is this. Jesus Jesus noticed something about the guests that were invited to this shindig. In their culture, certain seats around the table were for the most distinguished people among them. The, the, it's, almost, it, it's like the, the seats that were closest to the host or the, or the prominent person there at the, at the party, those closest seats were the best seats. 
And he noticed, Jesus did, that the invited guests, when they came in, they went for the best seats immediately. Luke eleven forty three, Jesus says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. They just love to be looked at. They love to be seen as powerful. They love to be seen as prestigious. They loved all eyes on them. And, and that may have been just accepted back then. They, they, may, they may do it without even thinking about it. That's might, that may have been a part of culture back then, just, just them doing that. People might have given them that kind of respect. But that which may have just seemed to be common behavior of that day, maybe unnoticed by them or other people, Jesus saw it. Jesus sees what we overlook. Jesus sees what we don't notice. Jesus sees that sin that has just become a common behavior in your life now that you're not convicted about anymore. Jesus sees it. And He cares about every action that indicates a sinful heart. So may we too care that our every action, big or small, honors Him in obedience and shows that we love Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. So Jesus tells them a parable to confront their pride and their selfishness of wanting the best seats. He says, he tells them, when they're invited to a wedding feast, if you take the best seat, then if someone more distinguished than you comes, you're going to be shamed in front of everybody. You're going to take that walk of shame. <laughs> Whenever in front of everyone, when the host asks you to move to the lowest seat so the more prominent person can have your seat. Being proud, you'll be humbled. Yet if you come in humbly, taking the lowest seat, then if the host wants you to move up to a higher seat, he'll do so and as such honor you in front of those that are there. So coming in humbly could lead to exaltation. And the point is clear. We are to live humble lives before God and others. All of us. All of us want to feel important. Just get in an argument with somebody you care about. All of us want to feel important. We can see that. But our desire to feel important can easily lead to sinful and selfish pride and self-promotion. There's a temptation in all of us to exalt ourselves. To exalt our opinions or, 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 or make our name great. To make a name for ourselves. To be counted among the popular, the prestigious, the powerful. We're all tempted to have a, a high view of ourselves. Wanting to be treated with the respect we think we are due. It's so easy to be self-focused. It's so easy to think about ourselves first even at the expense of others. It's easy when you go into a living room and sit in the recliner and let everybody else sit wherever they want. Because that recliner is the best seat in the house in my house. It's so easy when we come upon a cookie jar to take the big cookie and leave the crumbs for other people. It's easy in a conversation to insist on your words being heard and not others' words being heard. There's so many examples we could come up with in home. I mentioned getting in an argument with somebody. I mean, you, when you get in an argument with somebody, you don't, you're not interested in humbling yourself. You're interested in forcing your opinion. Work situations. I mean, there's just so many areas of life where the exaltation of self and our pride and, and wanting to be seen as, as popular and prestige, it's just, it's, it's, it's riddled in us. It's easy to be self-focused and think of ourselves first, even at the expense of other people. And those who live exalting themselves are going to be humbled. Jesus says it. Maybe in this life, pride comes before fall, Right? Maybe in this life, but definitely in the next. We aren't to live this way. 
No, we should be content to practice humility and be comfortable in the lowest seat, whatever the lowest seat is in whatever situation you're in. We don't live with a hidden prideful desire that someone will notice our humility and exalt us before others. You know how it is. It's that false sense of humility. Hey, let me go do this so everybody sees me being humble. That ain't humble, that's prideful. If, if you want people to notice your humility so you can be advanced, that's still pride. No, we're to genuinely practice humility. Sit with joy in the lowest seat. Lift others up instead of lifting ourselves up in pride. Treat others with respect instead of demanding respect for ourselves. Letting others have the best seat in a conversation or a situation. Thinking of others ahead of ourselves. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Paul says this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The Lord will exalt those who live this way, maybe in this life, but definitely in the next. The worst thing that can happen to us if we live humbly, putting other people first, is that we'll be exalted. Spurgeon says this. Let us not covet the highest place. Let us not desire honor among men. In the church of God, the way upward is downward. He that will do the lowest work shall have the highest honor. Our master washed his disciples' feet, and we are never more honored than when we are permitted to imitate his example. End quote. Humility is especially needed as it relates to our spiritual condition. And that may be the ultimate point right here in Jesus' telling of the parable. He is talking to Pharisees. Not to feign humility, have this false sense of humility, but to see ourselves for who we really are. Sinners, falling short of the glory of God. Rebellious idolaters, unholy, unable to do good, nothing in ourselves to make us worthy to be accepted by God, worthy of the eternal hell that our sins deserve, knowing we're the lowest of the low, the chief of sinners, as Paul calls himself in 1 Timothy 1. You see, admitting this about ourselves, humbling ourselves, admitting our, our sinful state, this is crucial to the gospel, crucial to understanding why Jesus came. Because it's precisely for a wretch like me. We don't like to think of ourselves as wretches, but we love the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? Wretch like me. We love that song, but we don't like to think of ourselves as a wretch. But we are, according to Scripture. It's precisely for a rich like me that Jesus took the proverbial lowest seat. He humbled himself and he came to this earth, as it says in Mark 10, to give his life as a ransom for many. Harry Ironside says, He who was entitled to the highest place of all came from the Father's house down to this earth. End quote. The omnipresent one was born in a lowly manger as a man. He took the form of a servant, it says in Philippians 2. He had no place to lay his head, the scripture says. He, he, he attracted the lowest of society. He faced major opposition from his own creation. He washed feet. He was called a worker of Satan. Jesus was called a worker of Satan. He was brutally beaten. He died a criminal's death unjustly. Jesus took the lowest seat when he came to this earth. And then, Philippians 2 8, he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And dying that death, 1 Peter 2 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 3 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous 
for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. You talk about taking the lowest seat and Jesus taking the lowest seat when he came to this earth. Oh, God becoming a man was such a drastic fall of humility. But when Jesus hung on that cross and the Holy One, the Holy God, bore your wretched sin and my wretched sin, that is the lowest of the lowest seats. And on that cross, He bore your sin, that, it, that the wrath of God might be poured on Him, that the wrath of God didn't have to be poured on you if you'll trust Him as your Savior. He rose victoriously on the third day to show that, that his mission to come take the lowest seat and take your sin and take the punishment for your sin, when he rose from the dead, it, it just signified, one of the things it did, it signified that that, that that payment was made. Your sin was paid for in full. If we'll trust him as our Savior, if we'll trust him as our Lord, he'll save you. He came and died in humility. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus came, he humbled himself, he took the lowest seat, he died in our place, he died a humble death, but God exalted him. One of the commentators. Um, uh, brought this out that I thought was awesome. It's like Adam in the garden in pride. He and Eve, they tried, they sought to exalt themselves become like God. But what happened? They fell. We call that the fall of man. Those that sought to exalt themselves fell. But Jesus who came to take the lowest seat and humble himself he is exalted. May we be like Jesus and not Adam. So to know eternal salvation with the one who will reign forever, who is exalted forever, we have to humble ourselves. We have to admit our sin, our unworthiness. We, we trust in Christ alone through faith alone. If we don't, we can't be saved. But when we do, oh church, listen. God exalts us to be seated with Christ. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Listen to these magnificent words. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Listen. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him. In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that when we humble ourselves before God and say, God, I'm, a, I'm an unworthy sinner and I need your forgiveness and Jesus is the only way, then he exalts us to, see, to be seated with God uh, in Christ in the heavenly realms. He exalts us there. We're, we are seated with Christ now. What a... Oh, goodness. Any merit that we think we have to make God approve of us we count it as loss, just like Paul did. Uh, but whatever was to my prophet, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I now count all things loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. Anything that we want to say, hey, I'm worthy, the God, you know, it just makes us feel proud. It's, it's no, it's counting all of that as loss and saying, God, I have nothing before you, nothing to give you. My only value now is knowing Christ and what he did for me. So it's humbling ourselves to be exalted by Christ and saved by him. So if we can't humbly admit our total inability to achieve salvation and admit our need for the work of Jesus alone to save us, then we're going to be humbled in eternity. Cast out with the unsaved. Just got a few more quotes here. They, these guys say it much better than I can. John MacArthur says, those, those bloated with the edema of pride will not pass through the narrow gate leading to salvation. Legan Duncan says, pride 
can keep you from the party that really counts. And then J.C. Ryle, to know our own selfishness and weakness and to feel our need of Christ is the start of saving religion. The purpose, uh, excuse me, the person who really knows himself and his own heart, who knows God and his infinite majesty and holiness, who knows Christ and the price at which he was redeemed, that person will never be a proud person. Ignorance. Nothing but sheer ignorance, ignorance of self, of God, and of Christ is the real secret of pride. From that miserable self-ignorance, may we daily pray to be delivered. The wise person knows himself and will find nothing within to make him proud. End quote. So, to close... Knowing who God truly is, that He's holy. Knowing who we truly are, we are not. There is nothing that, 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 that makes us deserve any kind of trophy, applaud it, applause, anything. Knowing who we truly are, that helps us walk in humility. Knowing we don't deserve any honor. Anything good in us is because He has given it to us. All honor goes to Him. It didn't come from ourselves. Seeing Christ's great humility expressed for those as unworthy as us helps us to follow His humble example, thinking of others as better than ourselves. I asked my wife last night, I was like, I need an illustration for in the morning. What's a place that that you go into and you come out smelling like it and it's just awesome. Because I thought about San Jose, nobody likes the way they smell when they come out of a Mexican restaurant. Although you love sitting in it and eating that awesome food. She told me this morning, she was like, how about an ice cream shop? I was thinking about maybe a candy store. Think about an employee that works in an ice cream shop or a candy store all day long. And they come out of that place, and it's like people are following behind them with their tongues hanging out. You know, and it's just like, oh, it just smells so sweet. A reminder of where they've been. A good reminder of where they've been. Something pleasant, something sweet. You know, when we're with Christ, we recognize who He is and who we are, and we recognize our, our humility before Him. We, we walk in humility. We, we walk with the aroma of Christ, the aroma of humility, with the aroma of who He is, and it is sweet. There's nothing sweeter than a humble person walking around. Those people who walk around entitled and arrogant and just expecting and trying to make their name great and you know, all that kind of stuff. That, that, those, are, those people kind of turn us off. But humble people, with the smell of Christ and His humility, it's just a sweet, sweet smell. So let's, let's keep the gospel deeply rooted in our hearts, that our lives would be comfortably and joyfully lived in the lowest seat, demonstrating the sweet aroma of Christ's humility in a prideful world that they may see the beauty of his gospel and be drawn to it. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you're not like us. God, we are so prideful. Thank you that you humbled yourself to bring us salvation. And so God, by the grace and power of your spirit, would you help us to fight pride? To fight that temptation to exalt ourselves? 
to let the sweet aroma of Christ's humility just, just come off of us, to just smell so sweet to those around us that they may be drawn to you as well. That they may see through our lives a visual demonstration of the gospel and that we might have the great privilege of sharing with them the gospel. God, help us. Help us. I continue to pray, God, that you would you would work among us and you would send us out to go show and share Jesus to this community and this world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and respond as the Lord leads you. Ken is available here. On a introduce somebody to you, Miss Lola, if, if, uh, had a wonderful visit with Miss Lola Morales yesterday, or the, last week, and uh, she had been to our Discovery Dinner and had shown a desire to become part of this family. You mind coming up here with, with me? And so today I am presenting you our newest member. Of, of this family, of this spiritual family. And we love her. I told her it was like she has been, she has been here for many, many months now. Uh, this is Candy Young's mother uh, and Mike Morales, who has been kind of in and out of this congregation over the years. And a uh, wonderful dear lady, had such a great visit with her. And we are so, I am so excited to introduce her to you today. I'm going to let her stay here so that you can come by and welcome her and tell her your name if you haven't done that over the many weeks that she's been here and uh, welcome. We are so glad to have you here. We love you and, and uh, looking forward to the years ahead to serve beside each other. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. 